smiling down on him at 115 miles an hour. The leaders are coming around at top speed. Look out! Bobby Myers and Paul Goldsmith slam into the stalled car. The cars are thrown 200 feet by the impact. Myers' car flips three times. The field is slowed as the three injured drivers are removed from the wrecks. Paul Goldsmith is on his feet, stunned but able to walk. Let's hear how the wreck looked to him. Coming down the back stretch, I was following Billy, probably about one car length uh, behind him, and his windshield was a little bit fogged up, and I couldn't see through the car to see ahead. And when I uh, moved towards the outside rail, then I could see past the right side of his car, and I thought I seen a car uh, on the groove. Just about that time, why Billy's car just disappeared. I didn't even see where it went. It's just like an explosion, and, and there was no time to avoid hitting it. Because when I hit it, why the back end come up over, and then I went up in the air. I don't know how high, but I came down, and then it rolled over on the top, and rolled over once, and back onto its wheels. beloved clown prince of racing, Joe Weatherly, died instantly when he lost his brakes and hit the wall at Riverside. Weatherly's car owner, Bud Moore, was overcome with grief. It was just hard on all of us. I know that uh, I come out and you quit racing myself. I told my wife when we come back from California, I said, I think I'm going to quit. I'm not going through it. So. She says, well, you got to sit down and figure it wasn't all your fault. He said, just remember them brakes y'all never had run on the racetrack and Ford Motor Company had you to take the car out there and put that type brake on there and say, so you got to figure they was at blame as much as you were. We'll let it go. And I kept on.
Robinson's running like an outlaw. Pat's chasing him like the sheriff. There's a spin. It's Bjorn Skeen, a rookie. Oh! Fred Wickersham catches him broadside. Bert Robbins slides and nudges Skeen's wrecked car. Somebody must have dropped oil in that third turn. Robbins is able to keep moving, but he's out of the race. Flag men and caution lights around the track warn us to slow down. Reb Wickersham walked out of that car with a few scratches, but Bjorn Skeen was pinned inside and cut free by the rescue squad. He's been rushed to the hospital. Well, here we go. I got no chance to win. Too much fast equipment up ahead. Well, too many drivers better than me. Don't even think about winning. Just worry the man ahead don't spin, don't drop oil, don't bounce off the guardrail right in front of me. No way in the world of missing him if he does. It's a nice cool day, but I'm in a sweat already. Don't think you'd be any different. Then it happens. So fast you can't think. Out of the corner of my eye, I see a car get sideways. I squeak through, bouncing off the guardrail. A couple other fellas weren't so lucky. There's the yellow light. Hold your boot off the throttle. Get her slowed down from 130 and keep a sharp eye for more trouble. I ease past the wreck and pray nobody got hurt. Thank the Lord it wasn't me. I still got a chance to run this race.
into the lead, but Baker takes it as a personal challenge to catch it. The equal machines glide through the turn. Buddy finally takes the lead, but Point hooks on to his tricky draft, fighting in the Dodge slipstream. The wreck brings out the caution, and the leaders duck into the pit.
Scott is relatively unknown, and they had a great race later on with John Anderson, of course, Richard Petty, who's not unknown at all. There's Benny Parsons lying in third spot. Tragedy coming in the 15th lap. The car of Benny Ricky Knotts crashing into the inside retaining wall. He sustained massive hit injuries and died in that crash. Car number 31 breaking loose and sliding across the track. He was terribly unfortunate as much as he glanced off the wall and lost no speed at all as he crossed about 800 foot of grass to run into the spectator retaining wall and was killed instantly. A 14-year campaigner on the short tracks in Michigan in his first effort at the Daytona International Speedway. Bobby Hill and the Texas driver 
in bad trouble from this skirmish. Dillon's number eight coming in. Crew Chief Jake Elder waiting on that car, and I would say that looks terminal. Yes, it does. That's an uh, extreme front end there to try to continue the race. Bobby Hillen, Crew Chief Jake Elder ready to go over the wall. Elder, who tutored Waltrip and Dale Earnhardt and started their grand national careers and worked with Terry Labonte for half of 81, part of 82. Now working with Bobby Hillen. Let's see what we can gather from replay as to what happened here. There's the number 42. He socked the outside wall already. And here he comes. They've, they've rebuilt that dirt barrier, and he really gives it a thump. Car number 42 says goodbye to this race. Car number 42, Terry Schumacher of Royal Palm Beach, Florida, in a Chevrolet. Crew Chief Barry Bostic is out of it. Terry Schoonover's car is still there, and we understand he may have been injured in that crash. The ambulance is there with the Schoonover car. Terry Schoonover crashing at the third turn, the entrance to the third turn. And let's look again and see if we can discern anything more from this incident. There's the 42. He has collected the outside wall, and here he comes, and this is a lot of impact. Yeah, he really hit that bank uh, hard. That's a sudden stop really jolts the driver and there was substantial damage to the car before he even hit the dirt bank. I think we have another angle. There is the, the Hillen car, Bobby Hillen's car. He, in an attempting to avoid the car number 42, got himself on the outside wall of turn number three. Tore up the nose on that car. Here's an update on Bobby Hillen's situation. Again, that number eight car badly damaged in that crash. They have torn away the grill and the front sheet metal, changed four tires, gassed the car without losing a lap during the pit stop, and the teenage sensation from Texas is back out there with a badly bent race car, but ready to get in there and fix it up with the superstars of Grand National Racing. That's quite an accomplishment. Bobby said he got cut off, and that's what forced him into the wall, but Bobby Hillen is back out there. Eight cars are now out of the race. Joe Buckman is the latest along with the Terry Schoonover car to fall by the wayside. Number eight, there you see Bobby Hillen's car. Badly flooded the front end. There's the end of the outside wall for the back straight. Then his problems really began as he slammed into the dirt bank. Safety crew taking some additional time. Back forward, looking out there for Terry Schoonover. Florida drive. He entered drag racing at age 16 and drove the short track in West Palm Beach for a couple of years. A part of the Buck Baker driving school. Worked out a deal uh, an engine company for a campaign in 85. It's taken a hard way here. I wonder if we can get a word with Benny Parsons. We've seen him a few ahead of that story. They're still working to move Terry Schoonover from the car. Gant has not led a lap today. He has not led a lap. They're, they're trying to cut the roof off, I believe, on car number 42. They've got to cut it out to get him out. Yeah, this, this looks like it's very serious. You have to go to the road and see the track driver from the car. Hopefully, uh, the carry's not too bad for something like this. You know, that terrific jolt that could have uh, uh, knocked the breath out of him before he went to the car. Just don't touch the truck. That was not too serious. 135 laps have been completed. 135 of the 328. Most serious caution today, Terry Schoonover's car has crashed savagely on a back straightaway. Did the outside retainer glanced off it when he hit that dirt retainer on the inside. It came to a sudden point. Yes, there's a good possibility the way the car is, is damaged uh, on the left side around the driver's door that he could just simply be have his feet or legs trapped in the car because of the metal bent in around it. We certainly hope that's the situation. Team 76 winner, Dave Marcus. Terry Schoonover is now in the ambulance. His dad was a very famous powerboat racer. I believe he may have been one of the first people in the old days of wrecking to put what they would consider a pleasure craft over 100 miles an hour. 32 years old and set very conservative goals this year. In fact, one time he said, all I, I wanted to do in 84 was make the starting field at Rockingham in Atlanta. And when you consider that 22 came here and did not make the starting field, he had a good start on this one. He had been in a serious crash. The ambulance is now bringing him back to the field hospital, just below the scoring stand, directly across from us to start the next one. Let's go to Dr. Drake. We're just out of the infill hospital.
conditions are on the back stretch. We have just a... Uh, consecutive races was heavily damaged in qualifying at Michigan. This accident has left Californian Rick Baldwin unconscious and in critical condition in a Jackson, Michigan hospital. Rick has no broken bones but serious head injuries and normally in these cases the extent cannot be determined until the swelling subsides. quickly extinguishes when the car is stopped. Fifth caution period of the afternoon. Grant Adcox hit the wall over in turn number two. There was some fire seen at the uh, conclusion of the crash, but it quickly was extinguished. And now the safety crews work on extracting Grant Adcox from the car. We see them with the jaws of life peeling the roof of the car back. They're going to, they're trying to bend it. You see they're beating, they're trying to bend the roof. So they now, there it's bending. Now they're finding able to where they can get down to Grant to extricate him straight up out of the race car. It's very difficult to get a race driver out of a stock car because of the fact that uh, there is a cover over his head and so there certainly is no indication of the seriousness of the accident. We have no word at the moment on the condition of Grant Adcock. 80s in Winston Cup competition. Grant Adcock's car on the back of the of the truck. Uh, severe damage to that car. There we see the right side. We can see just how hard did Grant hit that wall. You know, and my brother-in-law was explaining to me the other day, he was about how he fell out of the bleachers at a football game. Uh, and it was about two stories up. And I said, you just described to me what it feels like to hit the wall in a race car running about 150 miles an hour. Yeah. It's something that uh, most of us will never experience, thank goodness. <laughs> All the air leaves your body. When you hit, all the air leaves your body. And honest, if you're okay, it takes about two minutes before you can really get a decent breath. You're <laughs> trying to breathe. Please, I hope, you know, that's one reason I quit, folks. <laughs> I didn't get used to, I never got used to that feeling. Isn't it a lot safer and a lot more fun up here? Oh, it's a lot of fun. Thank you very much. <laughs> 
while we have the opportunity, let's just say uh, thanks to uh, all the people who have made our 1980. Grant Adcox is being airlifted to an Atlanta hospital. He has suffered injuries in a crash up in turn number two. He has been treated at the Enfield Medical Center, and now he is being airlifted to the hospital. We have no specific word on his injuries or his exact condition. All that we do know is that he is being airlifted from the racetrack to a hospital. The Atlanta Journal 500 was marred by the first Winston Cup fatality in five years. Grant Adcox was competing in his third Winston Cup race this year. On the 198th lap, his car suddenly darted to the right, hitting the wall with great force. A small oil fire quickly extinguished itself. It took rescue workers nearly 12 minutes working with the jaws of life to peel the roof off the car and get Grant out. After treatment at the Enfield Medical Center, he was airlifted to Georgia Baptist Hospital in Atlanta, where he was pronounced dead of head and chest injuries. Driving for his father, Herb, with whom he owned a car dealership, Adcox gained most of his racing fame in ARCA. He was king of the super speedways with eight victories, including five at Talladega and two at Atlanta. He had planned to continue his career, which began in 1968 in the NASCAR Grand National Division. Grant Adcox was 39. as he sets the car into turn number five. It gets way off the throttle, shifts to third, speed reducing to about 88 miles an hour, all the way down to 86 before he comes out of the corner and begins to stand on the throttle once again and accelerate up to 120, 135. Look at the speed increase. Out of turn number five, headed for turn number six. Speed increasing once again, second gear And turn. here's trouble, big trouble here in turn five. Oh, a car is upside down. Bob, there are two cars. They, they came in here so fast, and one of them did hit the other one and uh, did get upside down. Both of them hit very, very hard. I believe that's J.D. McDuffie who is uh, on his roof. And one of the drivers is coming out of the car right now. That's Jimmy Means. And now he's going to see if he can assist J.D. McDuffie in getting out of his car. McDuffie's car is on its roof, and Jimmy Means is calling for assistance. This is turn number five, the one that has created so many problems here at Watkins Glen, not only in Winston Cup racing, but also in uh, GTP competition. There's McDuffie. There's a wheel. Where in the world did that wheel come from as JD plows in the wall and evidently he has, and Jimmy Means goes into the wall while Means is in the air. Thank the Lord that he went in there while JD was up in the air. It appeared as if that wheel had come off the car uh, before he left the racetrack and went on to the grassy area there. But there is uh, 
major damage to the wall, as you can see. And, of course, our major concern is the condition of J.D. McDuffie. The other car involved is Jimmy Means, and he is already out of his car. The ambulance on the scene now assisting J.D. We'll be back with more from the Budweiser at the Glen in a moment. In Glen, the race has been stopped. We've had a serious crash over in turn number five. And here is a replay of what happened. J.D. McDuffie and Jimmy Means involved. This is McDuffie, the wheel already off the car, sliding off the track into the grass. He makes hard contact with that tire barrier in turn number five. Then the car overturns. Meanwhile, Jimmy Means also slides into the tire barrier. His car stays upright, but Means, or rather a McDuffie's car, is in an inverted state at the moment. Now, Means was able to climb out of his car almost immediately. He went to uh, check on J.D. McDuffie and signaled for the ambulance, and the ambulance, as you can see, has arrived on the scene. Here's Ned with Jimmy. Well, thank goodness Jimmy Means is out here walking around. A little bit of a skin there on the chin. Everything else okay, Jimmy? Yeah, Ned, I don't know what happened. You know, I've been looking. Uh, J.D.'s been in my mirror the whole time, and, uh, you know, I was kind of watching. He's running re really good, and I don't know where... I cut down on him, or he come in there, uh, lost his brakes or what, but uh, next thing I knew, it you know, hit me in the side. Uh, I hope he's all right. You know, he took a pretty bad leg care. So I'm fine, but uh, I don't know about J.D. Well, you went right under him, it looked like, when uh, when his car was up in the air. Yeah, I believe it did. You know, I just uh, I don't know what happened. It just seemed like, uh, uh, you know, if you lose your brakes going down that straightaway, away, you ain't nothing else to do, but uh, I don't know if that's what happened or not. Well, we appreciate you coming by and chatting with us, and uh, hope everything else is okay. Thank you, Neil. Jimmy Means, one of those involved in this crash down in turn number five. This is the same corner that Tom Kendall was injured in a few weeks ago in a GTP car when his uh, suspension or hub broke on that car and he went in hard and is now probably watching this race this afternoon from his home in California and doing well in his recuperation from leg and feet injury suffered in that crash. And now we are looking at the scene of the crash where they continue to try to get J.D. McDuffie out of that car. Let's go to Jerry Punch. Bob, I'm standing in J.D. McDuffie's pit. As you see, most of the crew members who work on J.D.'s car week in and week out are not here. They have already left to go back to the garage area to check on J.D.'s condition. Now, they had radioed to J.D. a couple of times after the accident and had not heard back from him. That doesn't mean that J.D. is injured. doesn't mean anything at all. As a matter of fact, if you remember back at Talladega when they had the major pileup in May, the crew of Kyle Petty couldn't talk to Kyle because Kyle's radio had come unconnected, which is not uncommon with an impact on a racetrack, and they thought Kyle was more seriously injured than he was, and they were, of course, afraid. But the crew here are unable to talk to J.D., so they have left the pit area, headed back to the garage area to try to get more information, and we'll update you when we hear more from down here. You just never know about the severity of these crashes. As you indicated, Jerry, some that look very bad turn out to be not all that bad as far as injuries are concerned. And on the other hand, some that don't look too bad can result in serious injuries. All we can do right now is just pray that J.D. is okay and he can be gotten out of that car quickly into the ambulance and treated at a local hospital. In the meantime, with the race stopped here at Watkins Glen, we'll take this break. Jerry Punch now with Chip Williams from NASCAR. Well, with further information on the status of J.D. McDuffie, here is Chip Williams, the Director of Public Relations for NASCAR. And Chip, uh, what's the information? Jerry and Bill, I, I regret to inform you that uh, J.D. McDuffie has passed away. Uh, he's 53 years old. Uh, of course, our hearts right now was his wife, Ima Jean, and, and, and his uh, children, Jeff and Linda, and it's, it's really a pretty sad day right now. A terrible tragedy here at Watkins Glen. And of course, uh, Chip, in the interest of safety, whenever there is a tragedy like that, you're always trying to find out the, possibly the cause of death to try to prevent this from happening in the future. Is there any information now as to what may have happened? Well, right now, uh, we don't know about the cause of death because of uh, the autopsy is scheduled for in the morning. Uh, as far as what happened to the race car, it looks like the possibility of a wheel breaking loose. We're going to look into that. We're going to look at the race car and uh, see what we can find out from there. Of course, we're not going to be able to do that until after the race. A terrible tragedy here at Watkins Glen. And Chip Williams, thanks for coming out from NASCAR Control and giving us information. That was not what we wanted to hear, but unfortunately, that occurs in the sport of motorsports. Bob? It is always difficult to report the death of any race driver. They know the dangers and the hazards, and they choose to race because they love it so very much. J.D. McDuffie was in his 653rd Winston Cup race. He had never won a Winston Cup event. But just last night, ironically enough, 
At Owego, New York at Shangri-La Speedway, J.D. McDuffie was involved in a celebrity race. And J.D. McDuffie driving the 07 car, believe it or not, took the checkered flag first and won that race just down the road from Watkins Glen International where his career ended today. J.D. got out of the car with his son Jeff watching and received the applause and the congratulations of all of those in the grandstand. J.D. McDuffie leaves his wife Jean and two children Jeff and Linda. And our sincere condolences to all of the McDuffie family from all of us here at ESPN. Gene, I know exactly what you're going through, sweetheart. And you fans out there, you wonder how these guys can get in these cars and go back out and restart this race. Hey, it's their job. It's what they do. There's 100,000 people here this afternoon to watch them do that job. There's not a one of these drivers that wants to be in that race car right now. They want to be in the garage area, hugging their wife, their girlfriend, their mom, their crew members, whoever. I don't want to be here now. I want to be over there looking at Ned and looking at Bob and just not saying anything. But we've got a job to do, and that's report to you who wins, who loses, and what happens during the day. Gene, we all love you, and we're sorry. Finally, tragedy struck the sports world again Friday. For the third time in 10 months, a NASCAR driver lost his life. Neil Bonnet died of injuries sustained from a head-on collision while practicing for the upcoming Daytona 500. The winner of 18 Winston Cup victories was 47 years old. There will be an air of tragedy hanging over Sunday's running of the Daytona 500. Two tragic deaths over a four-day span. The latest, Monday. Rodney Orr lost control and crashed hard on the track's second turn. The track was clear and dry. Conditions were good. Witnesses say his Ford Thunderbird flipped at a high speed, and the driver's side roof hit the wall. Orr was pronounced dead upon arrival at hospital. The cause of death, massive head and upper body injuries. Uh, that I guess you, you kind of get lured into a false sense of feeling that you can't get hurt in these things, but you know, still going very fast. And no matter how hard you try to uh, put protection in these cars, they're still 
they can be dangerous in the, in the, in the wrong situation, and I guess that's it's unfortunate we've had, uh, we found that out this week. Nineteen ninety three NASCAR Dash champion Rodney Orr was killed Monday in a Winston Cup pra practice crash. He died of massive head injuries and became the twenty seventh fatality in the track's thirty five year history. Rodney Orr was thirty three years old and was the reigning uh, excuse me, was running his first official laps when the accident occurred. The shock and disbelief from Friday morning's accident involving Kenny Irwin still looms over the New Hampshire International Speedway. Irwin's car hit the wall in turn three head on, barrel rolled several times and eventually caught fire, winding up on its roof in turn four. Fellow driver Brett Bodine was one of the first on the scene. My spotter was telling me to slow down, then when the car hit the wall I got up by the side and I could see it was Kenny's car. And it rolled the wall a long way around the third and fourth turn up on its driver's side down. And, uh, when it finally slowed down, it flopped over on its roof, and I, I stopped my car because I was worried as I fire, and I wanted to, you know, see if I could help get Penny out of the car for my fire. But the, the safety worker got there really quick. And, uh, I got halfway to the car. And there was no need for me to go over there, and uh, they were doing their job. The initial belief is that the throttle stuck on his Chevrolet. Team members believe the death was painless and instantaneous. With the accident fresh in mind, qualifying went on as scheduled Friday. But with everybody's thoughts still on the friend, they lost so suddenly. Obviously, it's very unfortunate. We've lost a good friend and uh, really a fine person. And uh, yeah, you just wish you had answers for these things. But uh, obviously, we don't. It's just been a tough, tough day. And, uh, we're all going to miss Kenny Irwin a lot. I think everyone's still in shock. I don't think they know how to uh, how to react right now. Or if this is uh, we haven't really had to deal with a situation like this. It's been many years. I like think Neil Bonnet at Daytona, but uh, it's, just, it's a tough situation for everybody. But I know that in his heart he was loved. He loved what he did to be a race car driver at this level. Tragic as it is, the story drips with irony. Irwin hit in nearly the identical spot in which Adam Petty hit when he lost his life here in May. go back to turn one for the final time. We'll soon find out Michael Waltrip doing everything he can to hold on to the race lead. He has to go low to block Dale Earnhardt Jr. He keeps it pinned down low. Earnhardt Jr. still riding in second. They're all chasing Michael Waltrip on the super stretch. Does Earnhardt Jr. have anything left? He's going to try. Waltrip to the bottom. Trying to throw on the block. Successful so far. Three wide behind. Halfway down the back straight away. Waltrip with maybe a one car length lead over Earnhardt Jr. to three. Michael Waltrip showing the muscle. Everything stuck up from third on back. Dale Earnhardt gets turned sideways. He'll take Schrader. Earnhardt and Schrader are in the wall. Waltrip leads off four. Coming down to the finish, though, it is Michael Waltrip trying to hold off Dale Earnhardt Jr. in 463 tries. Finally, Michael Waltrip is going to win a NASCAR Winston Cup race, winning the Daytona 500, the biggest of them all. Dale Earnhardt Jr. is second, Rusty Wallace third, Ricky Rudd fourth, and fifth is Bill Elliott. Let's go to Eli Gold. Sitting directly in front of me, the Ken Schrader.
Raider car and the Dale Earnhardt car. Earnhardt was on the low side of the racetrack. Someone turned his car. He went shooting up the banking directly into the route that Kenny Schrader was occupying. Schrader now very quickly calling over for the medical crews to come to attend and check on Dale Earnhardt. So Schrader climbing from his car very quickly ran to the number three, peers into the car and calls to the medical crews who are quickly coming to the scene. Dale Earnhardt took a really hard shot into that outside wall of the final lap here at Daytona. We'll update you further there in just a moment. Well, in hot pursuit of Dale Earnhardt Jr., who is going out toward turn four to see if he can find out about his father. He's looking up to the care center. Dale Jr., the care center is this way. They don't know anything yet about your father. Tell us about those last few laps. Well, I was trying to save Hi Michael. Let's see what happened at the end. But, uh, they had a big race back here. They had really no help. Michael won his first race. Did you have any chance of getting around him or did you have to help? I was just hanging on. Yeah, he had a good car. Junior is going to the care center. He's trying to check on his father. He 